Hello, everybody. Happy May 5th, 2020. My name is Christopher Saunders, and this is the Connecticut Sports Talent Show. We talk all things talents in Connecticut. And on today's show, we head down to the Pequot. And I think a lot of people need to understand the Pequot. There's a lot of talented teams. If you remember prior, if you've been you know, paying attention to all the recordings that I've been posting, whereas we had the head coach from Granby, Eric Shortell. Well, we have another head coach from Stafford Summers and East Windsor head coach, Brian Mazzone. Coach Mazzone, thanks so much for being able to come on today. Thanks so much for having me on, Chris. I appreciate what you're doing for the Pequot and, you know, every other team around the state. We're enjoying following it on Twitter. I appreciate that, man. You know, I really, you know, before we get into, you know, yourself, your coaching and everything, you know, my biggest goal is to get teams and conferences, maybe people that, you know, don't really know much about as far as the conferences and the teams. And I felt like the Pequot, you know, and Shortell gave me, he was telling me about how, there's so much talent. There's a lot of playoff teams that have come out of the Pequot, but because it's, you know, scattered around the state and, you know, for lack of a better term, people think about Hand and St. Joe's before they think about Granby and, you know, Stafford, Summers and East, you know, East Windsor. But still, they need to understand there's talent in the Pequot. Yeah, we've had a, we've had a great run of um, playoff teams and, um, mm -hmm. you know, our, our, league is traditionally split that Uncas and Sasakis vision, uh, mm -hmm. division. And that's the shoreline conference. Uh, it's like Valley, Cromwell, North Brantford, those teams. They've been a little bit more successful in the playoffs than the Uncas side has been. But we've yeah. had some really good kids, all staters, um, and, and gone and been competitive. Maybe if we didn't win, um, had some competitive runs in the playoffs. So I definitely think it's a league that, you know, has talent and certainly gets overlooked. Um, I think the, the co-op thing, Everyone kind of overlooks that because the co-ops usually don't do that well in the playoffs. Um, but I get it. I get it. We're a small league, and, you mm -hmm. know, not everyone's facilities are awesome, and our film's not great. And <laughs> <laughs> I get it, but it's, it's one of the things I enjoy about the league. You know what, Coach? Even though the film may not be great, the facilities may not be good, you know, I talked about Shortell. You know, Rockville, I mean, you name it. There's a lot of programs within the Pequot that are doing a fantastic job. The coaches are really doing well. You know, I, you know, like I said, I had an opportunity to talk to Shortell. I'm talking with you. I'll be talking to the Rockville coach in a couple of days. I'll be talking to Coach Becker on Sunday. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, as a broadcaster, I always want to learn. I love to read about different sports and players. And this is almost like a book for me being able to hear the wisdom and the knowledge that you guys have in the Pequot. And it's, for me, it's fantastic. I love it. I think uh, in the past, you know, I've, I've been in the league as a head coach for, this will be my sixth year, mm -hmm. um, but I was an assistant at Ellington for six years also. And um, the talent coaching wise, like we have some really good coaches. Um, mm -hmm. Like the, the guys that we have right now that are in that room when we meet, I'm like, man, there's some really impressive guys in here, and they're good guys. They're like really, really good guys, like guys I enjoy being around. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's something, you know, it's very easy to root for them, you know, um, and, and I like that. There's a great camaraderie in the league in that sense. Now, Coach, before we start talking about your time with your current team right now, as you mentioned, six years or about to be six years with the program, talk to me about your journey as a coach. Geez, man, I, uh, I kind of <laughs> had like a little gypsy life there for a while. Um, you know, I played at Enfield High School. I graduated in uh, 2000, so I mm -hmm. played four years there. In my first year of college, I did not play. Um, so I coached the freshman team um, in 2000, right out of high school. I was an assistant freshman coach. And uh, after that first year, I was like, I hate not playing football. I, I miss this so much. And somebody said to me, you know, you got the rest of your life to watch other people play. Um, and I went and I played the next three years at Westfield State College. And I don't, I don't know if I really knew I wanted to be a coach, but I knew I didn't want to give it up. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to give up football. Really? So I applied to be a coach in Ellington uh, in 2004. I was there for a year and I got my teaching certification that year. And at the end of that year, I got hired at Fermi, uh, the now defunct Fermi High School. Um, I was, and they told me when I got hired as an English teacher, they're like, you have to be a football coach here too. And I went like kicking and screaming. I was like, I don't want to leave Ellington. You know, I love, and we were, we were pretty good. And Fermi was, Fermi was horrible um, mm -hmm. forever until they closed, you know? And um, I spent five years there. We had a head coaching change. 
And actually, I went back to Ellington uh, 2010 and worked with pretty much the same guys that I worked with before. Uh, Keith Talkas was the head coach, and I loved Keith and, and, and those guys. And then um, I was actually the head coach. I got named the head coach at Windsor Locks in 2011. And I was the head coach for like three weeks. Um, and they, you know, we had some disagreements over who I could hire as staff and what I could do and all that stuff. And uh, I ended up going like Bill Belichick with the Jets. I resigned after three weeks and I went back to Ellington. Um, and then I spent five years there. Uh, and then I, then I went to Stafford in 2015. That's where I am now. Was there any part during that entire journey, which sounds like, you know, like you mentioned, Gypsy, we could put a lot into just your coaching travels and kind of what went into different things. Was there one thing in particular, either as your time as coach or even off the field that kind of really sticks with you to this day? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, my time at Fermi was more valuable than I could have ever imagined. Um, I think we went, so I was there five years. I know we only won nine games in the five years, nine games total. Um, we were the first team ever to have that, that 50 point rule instituted. Like we lost to East Hartford 60 to nothing. Um, we were in Sports Illustrated uh, for getting beat 60 to nothing. We were on ESPN. It was embarrassing. Um, we, we, we ended that season, we had about 17 kids that whole season playing in the CCC, getting our faces beat in. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the most valuable thing ever. And I had a couple, we had a couple of years that where we were really bad. Um, and it really taught me how to, you had to learn how to lose. Um, you know, I wasn't a good loser at, you know, 24, but I remember coming home, I was dating my, my wife at the time and I was like, why am I being mean to her? She didn't coach this bad football team here today. What am I being miserable about? Um, I had to learn how to, you know, work with that. Uh, you had to learn how to motivate. Um, and you had to learn how to teach when you knew there wasn't a lot of positive coming out. Um, so you had to really like practice became very, very important to me and the guys I coached with because we weren't getting much on game day. You know, game day, a lot of times you went in, you're down 21 nothing three minutes in, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was hard. So that, that, those Fermi days really, really stick with me. Those are important to me. You know, the, you know, your, your story kind of really resonates with me because as I'm watching, I don't know if you're watching the last dance with Michael Jordan and kind of, yes. you know, you are. Okay, great. So you might know what I'm kind of going with this where Jordan wanted to test his teammates to see how they would deal with adversity by yelling at screaming because he wanted his guys, he wanted to know what, you know, down by two with three seconds left, how are you going to be in adversity when things are on the line? And the reason why I bring that up is because for you, your adversity wasn't a game that was close. It was games that weren't close. And it tested your, your will, your aptitude, everything, you know, everything that you can think of as a coach. And for you to be at where you are now, looking back on what you had in the past, you have to feel like, you know what? I basically, I won the war and the battle. Because what you dealt with, a lot of coaches, a lot of good coaches may have not be at the level you are now because they would have said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I probably, if we didn't have a coaching change, I probably would have stayed up for any longer. I love the guy I worked for. His name is Pat Welkley. And when he mm -hmm. left, I was like, I don't want to work for anyone but him. Um, and then the Windsor Locks thing, that was like, that was embarrassing. Like, like everyone knew I got high. And, you know, two months later, I was like, wait, you're not the coach anymore? And you had to explain to everyone, like, you know, you kind of walked away with, like, your tail between your legs a little bit. And, you know, you're wondering, did I screw things up for the future? Did I, like, ruin an opportunity to get another job? Um, so that was hard. That was – but I, honestly, I mean, those were two great experiences because the Windsor Locks thing, I mean, I probably was too immature to get the job at the time, to be honest with you. Um, mm. And, you know, five years later, I wasn't. And, and that, was a, that was a good move. I learned a lot in Ellington. We had some great success. And um, it ended up being a good move for me. I mean. I still wonder though, that was like those teams. I don't know if you remember Jarvis Miller, the kid who he was playing at Penn State. I do. I would have had him and that uh Kamari Thomas was phenomenal. And that, yeah. I still think and, and Eric Knickerbocker, he's the um Rockville coach. Um yeah. he was one of the guys they they didn't want me to hire. Um, which that looks pretty stupid now because he's a damn good coach too. <laughs> um so it worked it worked out in the end. But at the time it was tough. It was tough. You know, everything happens for a reason. You know, there was a reason why you weren't supposed to be the head coach at Windsor. You can consider other factors as well. But 
you're at, you know, I think the right place at a perfect time, you know, considering what you've done for the program, looking at the first year, four and six, but the record doesn't, I think, say enough because it seems to me now looking at the following years, nine and two, 10 and two, 11 and one, eight and three, you've built a foundation about winning, but it seems like there's a lot more than just the winning aspect. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know, that first year, um, I, I always told people, you know, you could say four and six isn't good, but to us and those kids, that was kind of like winning the Super Bowl that year. Um, you know, we won on Thanksgiving, which is the last game, so you feel great about it. We beat a pretty tough Coggenshaw team that year. Um, you know, we beat Enfield, who, who, we, who we thought was was always a tough opponent in Coventry. We probably had a couple games we, we, we didn't win, but, like, we had no clue how to win. We had, I'll never forget the first game we won. We mm-hmm. got a personal foul for celebrating at the end of the game. And my AD was mad at me. And I said, I said, these kids haven't won a game in three years, man. They don't know mm-hmm. what to do right now. I said, they're just doing what other people do to them when they win. I said, they've never experienced it. Um, so that was a great year. And, uh, you know, the last two or three games, we kind of felt really confident about it. We lost to Lewis Mills, who was, uh, they were seven and two that year. Mm-hmm. We lost on the last, we threw an interception in the end zone, like 20 seconds left. We lost. And, um, that was kind of like, where are we, are we going to be good next year? What, what are we going to do? And the kids started getting getting excited about that. Um, so that was that was it was a good year to build on. Um, mm-hmm. Even though you know you're two games under five hundred, it, it felt a lot different. Was there one thing in particular as the years went on where you felt like, okay, I think that you know the foundation, you know, as I mentioned to, it's already built. Now I just need to add on a couple of things, you know you know, consider like building a house. Once you build the house, now you're adding in some windshields, maybe you're fixing the garage. Was there anything throughout the process over the next couple of years where you felt like you didn't have to add much, you were just fine tuning? Well, you know, I kind of feel that way in, in what we run offensively and defensively. Um, mm-hmm. I feel that way about our, our systems and we're really, it's really fine tuning. We're not changing up a lot of stuff we change little tweaks here and there but mm-hmm. not wholesale changes but um the the thing i thought was after like 2016 um we were a real mix of senior sophomore we had some really good seniors and really good sophomore when we lost those seniors i thought we would really struggle but the mm-hmm. one thing that was great was that culture kind of continued um and it, and it was like the way they treated each other the way they acted towards each other the way they got along the way they acted in school those were all good things i i I think I thought that would just kind of continue. Learned and, you know, it's, it changes every year. And like this year I had so many new faces. Um, you kind of go back to square one. You know, you go back to square one and say, all right, I got all these new kids that maybe not have, haven't been in the program as long. And you got to go back to your, your roots and what got you there. And I think that's kind of tough because when you're winning, you don't think that. You know, it's more like when you step back and look at it and you're like, because we got to tweak this a little bit and tweak that a little bit um, because those are things that made us so successful. But you know what, it, you know, it helps that you have players who have been with the program for a number of years who have been able to show leadership on and off the field. I want to hit on a couple of them, one of them in particular. We'll go one by one just to give the players their due. The first one, Dominic Zuccolo, who six foot two sixty seven, a center, Man, this kid is, you know, I was able to watch some of the film on him. He is a big young man. He's big. Yeah, he's even bigger. He's about 300. I think he's like two, 289. I think he was 300 during the season. Wow. Um, he's a summer's high kid. Um, he's a 4.0 student, um, excellent academically. And um, he's just a big body, works hard in the weight room, um, does anything that you ask him. Michael is a kid that uh, I've been hearing about for 10 12 years maybe he, he, he played very well didn't start the season for us at outside linebacker and uh i think by game three he was the starter and he really took off from there Briggs, uh he was a sophomore this past season he was all state at wide receiver started safety as well um he's a kid when he was a freshman um we were we were 10 and 0 a couple of years ago and mm. uh we'd be in practice and you know, the freshman practice, you were reviewing the Pequot, so you see him all the time, but you don't really notice a freshman that much. Every time something would happen, I'd be like, is that, is that Briggs? Is that, who is that? Running the ball with Mark like we had with Paul Angle in the past. And mm-hmm. uh, Mark had like 800 yards rushing. He played a little bit of quarterback, a little bit of running back, and didn't start till like week four. And he ended up being all conference uh, as a utility play uh, on the offensive side of the ball. And 
he's a kid that interesting, you know, he's like a bull in a china shop shop. He's like six foot two ten. And he's he's fast. Boy, he runs hard. I mean, he just puts his head down. And it's like he has no regard. And he throws the ball well. And I said, but the craziest thing about it is I don't even think he knows how to play the position yet. Like, <laughs> you know, he's pretty good and he doesn't even know what he's doing. I said, if this kid figures it out, he's gonna be phenomenal. Um, so he's those those guys get us really excited. You know, it sounds like you have a lot of talent that's returning as far as players who can really help, you know, the Stafford Summers, you know, East Windsor team continue on the success that you have built. And, you know, the next question I want to ask is kind of specifically around you as a coach. Has there ever, you know, has there ever been a moment where you kind of sit back and say, wow, I've built something pretty good here? You know, there was – um there was a couple times, um, you know, sometimes you're, you're, you're proud of what you're doing. You know, there's an article that comes out and something like that. And you see mm-hmm. things and people do stuff. But you try not, you're in the moment. You try to not think about it. Um, we went to the playoffs a couple years ago, eight, 2018, and we beat, um, we beat Cromwell. We beat him 41-6 to six that day. Um, and I think we were probably picked to lose that game by most people. And uh, we won that game. I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty awesome. In the next game, you know, HK beat us in overtime, and they played better than us that day. But I thought that was probably a game we should get. Um, hats off to them; they did a great job. But uh, I got named uh, the CHSCA Coach of the Year that year, and I was like, you know, me from from Stafford, like that really blew my mind, um, mm-hmm. and I was so honored. It was like, I can't believe other people think this of me in you know, tiny old Stafford. Um, and I was really, really proud of that. And, and then the, the, the one that really um, got me was uh, last year, I was the head coach for the All-Star Game. Um, and Harry Bellucci, he's the head of the Coach Association for football. And he, uh, I didn't really know Harry before that. And he called me. He's like, how would you like to be the head coach for the All-Star Game? And I just, I started laughing. I was like, <laughs> I was like hell yeah, man, let's do this. Um, because I was, I was in disbelief, you know. Um, I don't think of myself in, in that realm and, and with some mm-hmm. of those guys. And, Guys, I got to hang out with and that are my, my really good friends now. And, uh, you know, guys like Andy Guion and, and, and Tim Shea and uh, Mike Drury and you know, Jason Bruin. Those those are guys I talk to. Matt McKinnon every day. And I never, you know, those guys you were guys you read about, not mm-hmm. guys that you knew. Um, so that's kind of cool to kind of be in that group of those guys. That's a great story. I had no idea that you were the coach for the All Star team. That must have been like you, as you said. You at first you were like, wait, what? <laughs> and you started laughing, yeah. but. You know, I think, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, I, I always believe everything comes in, you know, in full circle almost. And I think yeah. because, you know, the journey that you start off with, dealing with what you did in the beginning of your career with all the losses and now being able to have success and people seeing that, you know, it's great that, you know, in a lot of ways you're not letting it get to your head and you're still kind of sticking to who you are as a person, no matter if you lose 800 games or you win 800, you're still the same person at the end of the day. Yeah, and, you know, the All-Star Game was so cool because I got to share it with so many of my friends. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I had McKinnon worked with me, and Jeff Russell was one of my best friends. Eric Knickerbocker was on there. and You know, I had Chad Neal and Alex, you know, Pat Miller. I could, I could go on, and those were guys, were guys who became friends and are good friends. My high school coach was on the staff, George Thomas, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of guys I cared about. Some of my assistants, Bo Weed, um, and it was cool to share that with all those guys. You know, I know my dad was really proud, and you know, my wife and my kids loved it. And it was, mm-hmm. it was really a special experience for me. And I think uh, just, I wanted to coach in that game one time as an assistant. And I did it the year before with Andy uh, mm-hmm. when we played Rhode Island. And so that was just the goal. And to get to do that and be the head coach was like beyond my wildest dreams. Um, so that was cool. And you know, the other thing too is you worry, when you're young, you worry about your record. You're like, oh, what's, our, what's my record? What's my record? What's my record? You worry about that. And as you get older, you're like, it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, it maybe changes how people perceive you and your program, but um, if you go, you know, one and nine or nine and one, like, I still love those Fermi teams that we went one and nine on. I had some great experience and great kids and kids I still talk to. And mm-hmm. Same way I feel about Stafford and some of the nine and one teams, you know. Well, I was about to say, your record with Stafford, if you want to know, you're 42 and 14, so. Pretty good. Been a nice run. Let's keep that going, right? <laughs> Let's get this COVID done with because I'm excited about this team. Coach, you've really done a fine job with the program. And, you know, we've just about run out of time. But, you know, again, I just want to thank you for being able to come on, you know, 
means a lot for you to be able to share your story about the Pequot and the program and some of the players. And again, being able to learn about the Pequot itself is always something that I want to, again, I want to learn as much as I can about the teams in Connecticut and being able to have you on as not just a spokesperson for the Pequot and wanting to see the best out of the Pequot, but being able to share your story about your team and your journey. You know, it was really fun. Yeah, thank you for having me. And like I said, you know, you kind of, you know, for people that don't know about what Chris is doing, you know, he reached out to me about the Pequot and uh, I'm always excited to talk about our league. And like I said, I think we got some really great coaches and really great kids. Um, you know, we, we just talked about some of the kids from my team, um, but you can go all around. I saw the profile you did on Jaquan Dufour the other day and, um, you know, it's great. Those are kids you root for because you see them all the time and you want them from your small league to do well. Um, and, and kudos to you, you know, this is a weird, weird time. You could be sitting back saying, I got no work and you're making work. So, so good for you going out and figuring that stuff out. Just don't tell my girlfriend. She's not very happy with me because I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's tough. I, my wife feels the same way about most things. Yeah. Right. But Hey, I, I always tell her, just give me two hours or give me a little bit of time to do what I want as far as sports is concerned. Cause this is really, there isn't sports on TV. This is all I really have. And then you can have the rest of the day for me. That's it. Yep. Yep. You know? That's tough. You, I mean, you know, I mean, I have a girlfriend, you know, soon to be wife one day, not yet. Happy yep. wife, happy life. That's how I live by. That's very true. Yep. That's very true. You know? so but coach, you're always welcome to come on anytime before, during, after the season, Anytime you want to come in to talk about the team, the Pequot, whatever it is, you shoot me a text, email, whatever, you're welcome to come on. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. And let us know what we can do for you in terms of the Pequot and getting information out there about the league and then obviously particularly Stafford. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Coach. That wrap things up here on the Connecticut Sports Talent Show. So until next time, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.